Thanks, Danilo. So, so okay. people again can interrupt whenever they want. This is informal, so so please go ahead. And... Okay, okay. Thank you all for coming uh, again for my talk today. Uh, yesterday I talked about disordered elastic system and the development of a unifying framework to derive and analyze the universal critical properties of randomly diluted networks near the threshold of a transition from a flop to a rigid state. Now, the main idea was simple. We combined lattices with the right properties and randomly removed the bond so that the fluid to solid transition would mimic that of a disordered system. Now, today I'm going to discuss the theoretical framework that we use to derive the universal scaling behavior of these networks. And I'm going to start with what's perhaps one of the simplest models to illustrate this system, this method. Now, let me start by talking about the elastic energy. And I'm gonna make a, a drawing of the triangular lattice here, as well as I can manage. Okay, I'll probably get those wrong, but then I'll try to fix them. Okay, I'm gonna fatten the masses here, just so that I hide that I've drawn them wrongly. Okay, you have a bunch of masses that are distributed in the triangular lattice. Oh, this one's bad, okay. And now you add harmonic elastic interactions in this system or springs between say sides i and j here, I'm gonna add some springs. And the energy of the system is gonna be simply given by k over two, absolute value of ri minus rj minus l square, where ri is the position of site i and L is some equilibrium distance here. Right. Now we usually prefer to work with displacements from the equilibrium positions instead of working with the positions themselves. So I'm gonna make the change of coordinates here. I'm gonna say that my RI is the equilibrium position of site I plus some displacement vector here. And then I can rewrite this simple term here that everybody knows as something like this. Ui minus uj square. And then there will be terms of the order of u cube that I'm going to ignore. This is, of course, a good approximation if the displacements from the equilibrium positions are small. Now, this is a convenient form because it separates uh, this, term, this part here that depends on the structure of the lattice in general from these who are the actual dynamical variables of the system. Now, suppose I, I randomly populate this lattice where, where, uh, <clears throat> with the springs. And by randomly, I mean, I'm gonna assign a probability for adding a spring here or not. So the energy, the total energy of the system can be written in general as sum ij. And I'm using the angular brackets here just because I'm summing over nearest neighbor pairs of sides in this case. Then there is a variable here, pi i, pi, pi j, eij. And I'm gonna take this variable pi to be a random variable satisfying this bimodal distribution. The probability of having a pi i is p 
delta of pi i minus one, one minus p delta of pi i. Okay, now, now this is the celebrated harmonic oscillator. So one would naively think that it is easy to solve this model and perhaps describe all of its properties exactly. Uh, yet it's not used at all. And it's not used because of disorder, of course. Disorder breaks the symmetry of translations by vec lattice vectors, which is an essential ingredient in the traditional physics of solids. Of so course, I just have a stupid question. Ri and Rj are, are two vectors, right? They are, yes. And, and this is the dot product of Ri minus Rj with Ui? Minus they are. They, it, it's the dot product. Okay. Yes. Thanks. I just couldn't. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I could put the arrows here, but. Okay, no, no, no. Because... I just didn't see <laughs> okay. the next dot. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, and of course, it would be easy to implement this model. Uh, 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 in numerical simulations. And you can also think of applying phenomenological scaling theories to study the rigid transitions of this disordered elastic system. But if what you want is a genuine microscopic calculation, you're going to need to rely on some approximate method. One popular way of extracting information on the scaling behavior of the systems near rigid transition, based on the replica theory of spin glasses, but that's restricted to sphere packings in infinite dimensions. So in the next part of my talk, I'm gonna discuss yet another powerful approximation that allows us to treat models in finite dimensions, such as the simple triangular lattice model that I'm using here as an example. So I'm gonna talk about now the effect medium theory And as a reminder, I've talked to yesterday. What effect medium theory essentially does is to replace this disordered elastic network by an effective homogeneous networks with the spring constants Kn that are chosen so that the response of the disordered system matches that of the effective system. Now, let me try to make this statement more precise. For this, I will need to introduce a few quantities, even though I will not have time to run over the details during this talk. Now, for simplicity, suppose the occupation probability P equals one in my triangular lattice, and the spring constant is Kn. So let me write this down here, P equals one, and the spring constant equals Kn for everybody. Now, now, this is a periodic lattice, and we surely know how to use Fourier analysis to determine all of its phonon and elastic properties. In particular, I can write down the energy as a nice quadratic form in Fourier space. It's given by this formula here, where Nc is the number of cells in the system, then there is a sum of wave vectors Q and Q prime, U dot UQ, D of minus Q. And depending on, on the book you look at, for instance, they will use different conventions for this minus sign, but that doesn't matter in the end. And then there is a U of Q prime there. And as you can see, the argument of the function in terms of Q and Q and Q prime indicates that I'm now working in Fourier space. Now, because the, the, this dynamical matrix here, this guy here is the dynamical matrix. Because it's translationally invariant, I'm considering this case where it's completely homogeneous, I can write it down as, and C delta of Q and Q prime D of Q. And, and this is one of the trademarks of 
periodical addresses. This form allows me, for instance, to write down the energy as an integral over the first Brillouin zone for the system. And, and I'm certain you can find an explicit formula for D of Q during not so long a time, but I'm not gonna do this here for the sake of time. Now you can also write down what we call the Green's functions for this system, G, and it can be defined from this equation here in Fourier space, U of Q, that's the displacement, the Fourier component of the displacement is the Green's functions G times some applied force, F of Q. It now comes simply for, from using Newton's law that I can find a relationship between these Green's functions here and the dynamical matrix. If you just uh, apply uh, the equation of motion of this system, you can write down that your Green's functions G of Q is equal to something like this, omega square identity minus D of Q inverse. And right now I have introduced introduced also the frequency in the dynamical response because it's convenient to work with in frequency space as well. Now let me go back to effect medium theory and let me draw just a little piece so of may, the- may, may I ask you a question here? So, sure, um, sure, go ahead. Sorry, I'm coming from this field. So uh, I'm something I'm not getting. So you're giving the energy and what is the goal here? So you're in thermal equilibrium. So you have some free energy and you want to minimize the free energy or what is the goal? At, so what do you want to compute with that? Yeah, yeah. So, so my goal is to find an approximation that will make my homogeneous system look like the disordered system. And this approximation is going to be based on comparing the Green's function or the response function of the homogeneous system with that of the, of the diluted system. So, so that's why I, I introduced the, a formula for the Green's functions, because that's the basic quantity that I'm going to consider when I do the approximation for mapping the diluted network into the homogeneous network. Okay, so you, want to find another, you find another, another model? Yes, and, yes. And I, 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 green function, exactly. and then you want to match the two green functions and then replace by the other model and solve the other model. That, that's correct. That, that's correct. Okay. That's why that, that should become clear as I go over ahead more over the calculations, but that, that's essentially it. I'm mm -hmm. going to replace it that diluted system by a homogeneous system. And this homogeneous system has to satisfy some conditions, which is comparing the two Green's functions, basically. Can okay. You can't you obtain this by summing uh, class of diagrams? I mean, if can, we, can you say that again? I'm, I'm sorry. Can you obtain the same by uh, solving in perturbation theory in the disorder and average in term by term and uh, so summing over a certain class of diagrams? Uh, it's, the, it, it's possible that there is an approximation based on this kind of perturbation theory that gives the same solution as the coherent potential approximations that, I, that I'm going to use, but... Yeah, it's yeah, but, in the, for electrons, that's how it's done, you sum the rainbow diagrams. Exactly, exactly. I mean, they, these, the approximation that I'm going to discuss is based on what, what, what was made for electrons in, at the beginning, you know, for a strongly correlated system. And then it, people from other areas used them in, in, in these randomly diluted networks, but it was initially proposed for electronic systems. and, and there is a connection with, with the perturbation uh, um, theory that you're mentioning, but I, I yeah, I cannot discuss this here. <laughs> okay, so now what, I, okay, I'm drawing here a piece of the triangular lattice. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, uh, this goes on and on. And I'm gonna assign a spring constant Km to every bond here, except one bond, which I'm gonna change. And I'm gonna change it to a different spring constant K prime. Now, 
this system is no longer translationally invariant, but I can still write down quantities such as the dynamical matrix and the Green's functions. The dynamical matrix now shifts to this formula here, the D of Q and Q prime. Now I'm putting here this V here just to indicate that it's perturbed. It's equal to the dynamical matrix of the unperturbed system plus some perturbation V of Q and Q prime. And then it's not very difficult to see that this perturbation V here is going to be proportional to K prime minus Km. And that follows, I mean, it's very easy to replace this bond here, add and sum the spring that's connected to it and calculate this. And then the Green's functions here, the perturbed one is given by the usual formula. It's GV of Q and Q prime. It's omega square identity matrix minus DV of Q and Q prime. And this two minus one. Now, the nice thing is that I, I can write down another formula for, for this perturbed Green's function and express it in terms of the unperturbed Green's functions and what you, people call the T matrix. And I'm not going to the details here and the algebra, but in the end, what you get is something like this. G of Q, then there is the T matrix here of Q and Q prime, dot G of Q prime. And this is a very interesting form because it allows us to define precisely what I'm gonna do in the coherent potential approximation with which the kind of effect medium theory that we use. There are other forms that give similar results, but that's the one that we like because it, it has nice dynamical properties. Now it would be wonderful to go over all the detailed calculations, but that would take more time than I, than I have here. The algebra involved is simple, but still it has to be done carefully. Now note that all the information about the imposed defect that I put in the lattice here is on this T matrix here. And now we get to the point that you can precisely state what effect medium theory does. What we do is to replace the disordered network by a homogeneous network with the effective spring constant Km that's determined by the condition uh, average T of Q and Q prime over this random variable K prime here equals zero. And that's our effect medium, that's what leads to our effect medium theory equations. And the average here is taken over this K prime variable, which should satisfy the same probability dis distribution we assigned for the lattice. So my P of K prime is equal the small p delta of k prime minus k has a probability p of have a spring with spring constant k plus complementary probability one minus p of not having a spring there. Okay, now this equation here is equivalent to say that the average perturbed Green's functions is said to be equal to the unperturbed Green's function. Now, the fact that the perturbation involves a replacement of a single spring constant that's immersed in, in an effective environment reflects the mean field character of this approximation. Some correlations are definitely ignored there. Now, 
it comes as, as a surprise that this effect medium theory provides a very accurate description of disordered solids, even in the vicinity of the rigidity transition. There are certainly some uncontrolled mechanisms at play here, but this is partly due to the fact that the upper critical dimension for most of these systems that we study is two. Now I'll move to the last part of my talk and discuss. Sorry, you, I think your equations are very clear, but I missed a bit the physical intuition leading to them. I don't need the algebra, but uh, what's the physics of the first boxed equation? So there is an unperturbed propagator, and then there are two propagators that interact with some T. I mean, there surely is some physical, simple physical picture for this equation. You, you, you want an interpretation for T? I don't have an interpretation for, for the equation in, by itself. That, that's just a convenient way of expressing the perturbed Green's functions and separating the part that depends on, it, on, on the unperturbed system. This is not like some kind of Schwinger Dyson equation where the various terms have some nice graph. I wouldn't know. I don't yes, know. Yes, it is. It is. In it fact, be, the yeah. non diagonal is a non forward scattering, <clears throat> as you should know. Yes. It's scattering <clears throat> theory which we're doing here, and it's a non forward scattering part. In the S matrix, as an identity part plus a T matrix, right? That's usually how it's written in quantum mechanics. Right, but and then what is the equation? But then T should 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 be is the non-diagonal part. Right, right, and it should be found self-consistently. But I yeah, but then that's what he's doing. He's uh, making a self-consistent approximation. It's equivalent to average term by term, and summing a series of diagrams. You get a self-energy that essentially plays the role of the expectation value that he's going to calculate. That's what I thought. But the second, the second box doesn't immediately ring a bell. Why is the second box equivalent to? So the, is it true that the second box no, is another way of casting have the second green function to be the same as the one on the other side of the equal, equal sign. When you do the T matrix, you is this is the bare green function that that enters is a bare propagator instead. The Dyson equation. In the Dyson equation, the second in the second term of the right hand side, the second green function should be the exact one in the in the Dyson equation. Ah, okay, that would make more sense. Yeah. So okay. one of the G's yeah. is G V, right, on the right. In the Dyson equation, that would have been G V, but here is G. That's why he has this T matrix. Right. And then the whole problem becomes in calculating this T matrix. Exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it has to make an approximation to compute this. Yep. And, and maybe, sorry, this was already asked in a slightly different form, but which things do I expect to get right? I mean, you're not going to get everything right because you're going to, you're, you're going to, Oh, okay. Okay. You're, 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 in in imposing self consistency, right? You're so I mean, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, in correct. thinking okay. diagrammatically, you're clo You're doing some closure or something, right? And so, which wh what 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 quantities do you expect will will come out right? Uh, okay. So so you notice that I'm replacing one single bond of the lattice, and I'm I'm ignoring the correlations of that would appear if I'm were to treat the whole system. What we expect to get exactly right is the vicinity of having a very dilute system. When, when you have no dilution at all, you get exactly the same solution, the right solution, because this term is, just doesn't appear here and it's just the unperturbed degrees function. The more the diluted system is, the more close to P equals one in this system, the better your approximation. But I, what ends up happening here is that you even far away from P equals one, even close to the critical point, this approximation continues to be good and continues Why? to be- Why? That's an uncontrolled approximation. So it's, it's hard to see why it continues to be good. There are some system that it doesn't work as well. For instance, if you have bending forces, in fact, medium theory doesn't work as well as if you have just these mass spring systems, 
we, we have to rely on some uncontrolled approximations, but in the end, it's, it's not well understood. As far as I know, there, there's not a clear understanding of but why it works this, well. Is, because this related, is this related to what we were asking yesterday about these exponents versus this universal scaling function? Or am I confusing things? Remind me of so yesterday you were showing part both of... exponents and some universal yes. scaling function as well, right? That's correct. Yes. So, do we trust? Is it true that the exponents we trust for sure, but this universal scaling function is more? Oh, okay, okay. So we trust. Wrong or no? no, no, no. That's one. One thing is the approximation here that involves some unco uncontrolled mechanisms that we cannot explain very well. And you have to rely on them and test with numerical simulations and they seem to work. And, and that's basically what you do. Now, if you compare the results we get for exponents and the correlation and the universal scaling functions, they match quite well the results we get from numerical simulations, for instance. So we expect that the predictions are still good for universal scaling functions. Now the underlying mechanism of the CPA of the, that involves uncontrolled approximations, that's not, I mean, that's, uh, that involves uncontrolled approximations, but it doesn't have to do with the fact that we match the experiment or, or, or the general simulations for the exponents for, and the universal scaling functions, okay? So what's the criterion for the goodness of the approximation? Do you expect this approximation to be better in high dimensions? I expect this approximation to be good at p close to one. That, that's certainly in, true. In all dimensions? In, in all dimensions, yes. Not, so or not at, least, at, least, at least above the upper critical dimension. But then for these systems, the upper critical dimension is thought to be true. I don't know if there are any proofs that it's actually true, but. Well, for instance, this approximation in it inherently neglects the rare events. That we That's, true. That's true. That's true. They exist in all dimensions. And they are particularly important in lower dimensions. That's true. Mm -hmm. So at some point, something has to give. <laughs> no, that's, I, I agree with you, yeah. But then, I mean, that's true, but then we test this with simulations and experiments and this seems to work even though, but I, I see your point, that's true, yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll continue. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna now discuss the universal scaling behavior that we find using this approximation. Can you explain in what do you mean by universality in this context? I mean the critical exponents and the universal scaling functions that you can extract? Well, universal is a very technical, is a technical term. Okay. Yes. It means that if you change the theory at the microscopic level, you do not change the scaling function. So mm -hmm. at what point this can be tested in this calculation? Say that again, what do you mean? Well, you do the calculation, you get an answer, and then you proclaim this is universal. So what do you do to test if it is truly universal? Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand so instance, your question. You could question. change the probability distribution, you could change the coordination number, you could change many properties. Mm -hmm. Um, and in principle, it shouldn't depend. Does it depend, for instance, on the coordination number of the lattice? It doesn't. I mean, we can have, you can have different lattices, you can have different topologies. And, can you add and in, in so far as, in so far as you. 
Can you have next nearest neighbor couplings and those? We, we can, we can. In so far as the- They don't change this function. They don't change the function, the universal function. So what do they change? Unless they change non-universal quantities such as the critical point or something like that. Right. The critical probability. Right. Right? That's the only thing in the amplitudes, presumably. Yes, exactly. But doesn't change the exponents or, or the shape of the function. Has that been tested? Say that again. Has that been tested? Oh, that, oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. For, for a bunch of different kind of lattices and systems that fall into that same scaling function, the same critical exponents. That's all that, that I'm gonna use in terms of yeah universality, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me be more specific about the effect medium theory equation that I have just described. And I'll start by writing down an explicit formula for this T matrix of the triangular lattice that I have been discussed, discussing. So for this triangular lattice, you can calculate this and find that T of Q and Q prime is some vector V1. And this is an outer product, V1 of Q, V1 of minus Q prime times K prime minus Km. This is the effective spring constant here and one plus K prime over Km minus one age of omega. And this age of omega here is equal to minus one over Z tilde and C sum in Q trace of D of Q, G of Q and omega. Now the Z tilde here is the number of bonds per cell, which for the triangular lattice is just three. Now, do not worry about the explicit formula for this B1 vector here. You would have derived the formulas for them when you calculate the dynamical matrix, for instance. Um, now, the formula is very simple because of a, a geometric series that you, you naturally merges in the calculation of the T matrix for these systems. But again, I do not have time to run over the details. Now, when we set the average t equals zero, I only have to be concerned about this part here. So what I end up getting is p times k minus km over one plus k over km minus one age of omega plus one minus p minus Km over one minus age of omega. And this is set to be zero, which now can be rearranged as the simpler formula here, Km over K plus P minus age of omega over one minus age of omega. Sorry, Danilo, sorry for insisting on my bill. Go, go ahead. But I, I cannot imagine that. So you started with a problem that was very well defined, right? And it was probably, it was possible, at least in perturbation theory, to solve it order by order in perturbation theory, right? And isn't it true that what you are doing would be like resumming subsets of diagrams? Instead of treating all terms of perturbation theory, you resum fully some particular subset, which then a posteriori you realize that experimentally or numerically seem to give a good agreement with the full system. Yes, uh, honestly, that, that, that's a very good question, but uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, I would have to look carefully into connecting this to the whole di diagrammatic expansion, but I've never done actually this. 
It's just that it's it's possible series, that's true. Your metric series must have some simple physical interpretation, like the particle interacting might. with the impurity several times, and each time it interacts, it picks a factor. In, in, in terms, uh, yeah. So in terms, must, there of must the, be physical pictures for these formulas. It's, uh, yeah. So it, in terms of the electronic system, when talk about bonds, it's harder to interpret this. But when you you, you remove a, in, in the proposal for for this method for the electronic system. You were actually ignoring multiple scattering in your system. Right. And that's why you only get this geometric series because you, you the particle right. goes and scatters. Yeah. But there should be some nice physical interpretation, therefore, of these equations in terms of some equilibrium condition for these scattering processes. I, I agree with you. I, I haven't seen that, but it probably exists there. Yeah. Usually some of rainbow diagrams. Yeah. <laughs> it, should, it should be something like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay, so so th this is the kind of formula that we end up using in our numerical and analytical calculations in the end. Now, you note that this age of omega here depends on the dynamical matrix and the Green's function. So it depends in general on Km. So you have to solve steps consistently for the effective spring constant as a function of general probability P and frequency omega. Now, even using this coherent potential approximation, which is the name of the method that I described, for the simple triangle lattice, it's still hard to find general analytic solutions for Km of P and omega, for instance. And you will need to rely on further approximations and concentrate on the behavior at the vicinity of the critical point, for instance. Now, however, at, the zero, at zero frequency, this system is so simple that we can solve it completely for the triangular lattice. If you have zero frequency, the Green's function, g of q and zero, is just the inverse of the dynamical matrix. And then my age of zero here is equal to one over z tilde, and C, sum in Q, trace D of Q, minus D of Q, minus one, and you can quickly, uh, uh, th there is a dot product here. You can quickly realize that this is just the dimension that's two for this lattice over Z tilde. And then we get our first uh, uh, formula here, which is Km over K. It's just some constant here, P minus PC, some exponent beta, where I know what C is. C is given by one over one minus D over Z tilde. My critical probability here is d over z tilde, and the exponent beta here is one. So the effect medium theory correctly, between quotes, predicts the isostatic iso critical probability, pc equals d over z tilde. Now, if you want to see that this is true, one has to multiply pc by the coordination number of the triangular lattice to find what people call the Maxwell limit of mechanical stability, which this equals 2D, right? But this effect medium theory goes beyond that and also gives the mean field behavior that's expected for these disordered elastic systems with a linear decay of the spring constant as P approaches the critical probability PC. Now, of course, if you, as also Eduardo has mentioned before, I put correct between quotes because the critical point, for instance, can be slightly different in simulations where fluctuations lead you to all those under-constrained and over-constrained regions for all the samples. So the results do not always match in so far as these non-universal quantities are concerned. Now, with a, a little bit more uh, of effort, we are able to describe the frequency dependent scaling behavior of Km and then write down the solution for Km in terms of P and frequency. 
and it, I cannot, I do not have time to show it here, but you, you, you get something that looks like this. B minus BC, some exponent beta. And then there is a, a universal scaling function here over omega B minus BC to some exponent C nu. Where we know not only the exponents here, beta and Z nu, but also an explicit formula for this universal scaling function. F of X is given by C over two square root of one minus BX square. All of this plus or minus one. And again, that's the same from yesterday, the plus and minus sign correspond to the rigid and floppy phases and C and B are just con constants. Now, I have not presented oh, the- I have, I have a question. I, I apologize sure. because I came in a little late. So I don't know how you define the dynamics, but typically the dynamic at critical exponent Z depends on the dynamics that you assume in these classical problems. That's right, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah, so so this, this, is, this, this was done for undamped dynamics, for instance. For what? If, uh, undamped. Undamped. So you, know, yes. you, you didn't do the, the overdamped dynamics gives a different exponent, for instance. So Z is two here? Uh, let me see. Nu is one half Z is two. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, F of X is given by this. And I have not presented the derivation of macroscopic quantities such as the elastic moduli. But in, in this simple case, they are given simply by a constant times Km here. So they present the very same scaling behavior that I'm showing here. Let me put this in a red box. Now, this simple uh, example covers the universal scaling behavior of a large class of disordered elastic system. But it does not describe what's traditionally called jamming, which should display a jump of the bulk modules at the transition, as I showed yesterday. Now, to describe jamming, we had to come up with a combination of lattices for which there is a regime where the bulk modulus is finite, but the shear modulus is zero. As I have shown, we can achieve this goal by combining the honeycomb lattice, the lattice of graphene, with the triangular lattice. So let me try to draw them quickly here, just as a reminder. We have the honeycomb lattice here. Right? And then I add next near, nearest neighbor bonds, which will form a triangular lattice or two triangular lattices, depending on the model that you're going to consider. For instance, if I take the, this side here of the end cell, they form this lattice here. And as I've done before, I'm gonna fatten these sides just so that they cover up for my drawing here. Okay. All right, so, so, so you, you have a combination of a honeycomb and a triangular lattice, and I'm gonna populate the sides of the honeycomb lattice with probability pH, and those of the triangular lattice with probability PT. Now, the general method to tackle this new system is similar to the one I have just presented. The dynamical matrix is now a sum of two contributions, one coming from the bonds of the triangular lattice and the other coming from the bonds from the honeycomb lattice. And I can write very generally that 
D equals some DH plus DT. And then I, I can derive the effective agent theory equations following essentially the same fr framework that I have just outlined. I'll not present the details here, but just the final set of self-consistent equations, which gives KH equals DH minus HH of omega over one minus HH of omega. And then KT equals PT minus ADT of omega over one minus ADT of omega. And these two Functions here, I can write them explicitly. They are given by minus one over Z tilde H and C, some Q. Z tilde H is the number of bonds of the honeycomb lattice per cell, trace of DH of Q dot G of Q and omega. And I have a similar equation here for, oh, this, this should be H here, for ADT. ADT is minus one over C tilde T and C, summing Q, trace the T of Q, G of Q and omega. Okay, now these equations must be solved for KH and KT as a function of the probabilities PH and PT and the frequency omega. Now, even though I follow the same framework, the model is, this model is much subtler than the simple model for the triangular lattice that I described earlier. The honeycomb lattice has fewer bonds per unit cell. Can you give some intuition please again about the physics of this approximation in this case? Are the T and the H equations decoupled or do they couple? By they are not, they, they, they couple. Okay, okay, let, let, let's look at them again. So, so the, the dynamical matrix now is a simple sum and that's completely decoupled for the honeycomb and the triangular lattice. But the Green's functions that appear here is the inverse, apart from the, 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 uh, the diagonal term, it's the inverse of the dynamical matrix that contains both of them. So it, it, these two equations are coupled and the Green's functions depend on both the KH and KT. Sorry, but in the phone and language, this G is the propagation, right? This G is the propagation. So is it true that, um, so it propagates, of course, in both, it can propagate in both lattices. Yes. But then, uh, uh, is it true that it either interacts with H or with T with an either an H perturbation or a T perturbation at the time? And so you, you treat as if it's either one or the other or no? So. I, I don't treat them separately here. In the end, I, take, I make some approximations where, where one of the spring constants is very small. Okay. No, it is just, but, okay. I kind of follow more or less the algebra, but it's very tough for me to follow without some more physical picture. I'm struggling to... I'm to yeah. Okay. So it's, go on, please. Okay. Okay. So the honeycomb lattice has three bonds per unit cell. So it, it has a frequency that vanishes over the entire Brillouin zone. Mm -hmm. Now, that one of the important things is that this dynamical matrix DH here has a no space. So one has to be very careful when, to deal with the singularities here of the Green's functions when one derives the asymptotic solutions from the effect median theory equations. Now, again, I'm not going to these details. I'll now remind you what the phase diagram of the system looks like and then briefly discuss its scaling behavior. So let me draw the phase diagram that I showed yesterday. There is a pH here and a PT here. Then there is a line here, which we call the rigid percolation line that terminates into a jamming point there. 
and this guy here is one and there is another one there. The system is rigid here and floppy here. Now, this behavior can be directly mapped into the behavior of microscopic quantities, such as the elastic moduli, but I'm not going to discuss this here. Let me just briefly mention the asymptotic solutions we find for KH and KT, which should clarify how the system behaves near this jamming multi critical point there. Now, the asymptotic solution I find for KT is essentially the same one as the one I described earlier when there was just the triangular lattice. But the solution for K8, for the honeycomb lattice, the fracture spring constant of the honeycomb lattice, in the neighborhood of this jamming point here, is given by this formula there. Let me just be consistent and put this in blue. It's KH going as KT over KT plus a constant times one minus pH. Where C is a constant. Now it's clear that for instance, for rigid percolation, where both moduli goes to zero, both the spring constants go to zero here in this case, uh, one has a finite value for this one minus pH here. So it, it dominates over this, this small spring constant of the triangular lattice KT here. So KH essentially scales the same way as KT. But if I approach this jamming point here, you, you, you notice that right at the jamming point, one minus pH is zero. So these two ter terms cancel and I have a finite KH. And that's what ultimately is gonna give you a jump in the bulk modulus. Okay. Now I can extract much more information from these equations. For instance, I can describe the crossover scaling from jam into rigid percolation. And I could even make an educated guess for what a renormalization group flow diagram should li look like for the system. But my time is up and I, I should wrap things up now. And if you're interested, let me know and be happy to discuss this further another time. Now, I have arrived at the end of my talk and I only hope that this overview has been sufficient to give you a better idea of the theoretical machinery that we use to describe these disordered LASK systems near the onset of a rigidity transition. Now, once we know the scaling behavior of the spring constants, the next step is to translate these results into predictions for the scaling behavior of macroscopic quantities such as moduli, viscosities, susceptibilities, and correlation functions. We have a few different methods at hand to make these connections. Now, I have a couple of questions. Are you done? Uh, I have some general questions for you. Just so, um, so that I finish this part, I'm very excited about extensions of these models, of course. That would include, for instance, the incorporation of ingredients such as anisotropy and friction, as well as the study of other lattices with suitable elastic behavior. I'm also interested in figuring out the role played by finite temperatures, the possibility of a dynamical change of the network topology, and some field theoretical ideas for topological mechanics, for instance. Now, all of these topics have interest to many different systems and are likely to lead to a very fundamental and unifying description of the rich critical behavior exhibited by these disordered elastic systems. So thank you. Uh, now take more questions. So I know that one of your collaborators, Tom Lubensky from Penn, has been working on this problem of isostatic equilibrium for quite a while. I want to know what is your contribution different from his? You know, he's a well-known person in the field, right? Yes, yes. I, I, yes, I, I can point out exactly where I entered. And I entered exactly with this 
Well, we had a paper before, but the most important contribution came exactly with this paper on defect vision sear for jamming. There were lots of different results exploring, for instance, fiber, fiber networks where there is also a bending force and things like that. And the rigid percolation transitions in a variety of different lattices. Zhao Ming Mao with Tom Lubensky looked into a variety of these different systems. The Kagomed, the triangular lattice, all of the systems different. And they had very interesting, uh, lots of interest on their own. But I came with this, I mean, when I came in, the most important contribution was this work on, on jamming with combine the honeycomb and triangular lattices to have a lattice that displays a jump in the bulk modulus. And that's where I, where I basically entered, yeah. Okay, the other question is, what do you think is actually missing in this theory? What, what is actually missing in this theory? Is there, there are, I mean, in so far- What do you think should be done to go beyond this, what you've done? <laughs> No. Uh, uh, okay, the, the, there are lots of, of different ways of going about extending this. And one of the ingredients that I, I'd like to do, for instance, is to add some correlations. In, in a sense, if, if you remember, for instance, the beta lattice calculations and people then stop using Cayley trees and go into Fushimi trees, mm -hmm. And to, to add some local correlations and some loops and things like that. I believe that it's possible to generalize the CPA equations for more complicated situations where instead of replacing just one bond, I replace more than one bond and, and add some correlations to that. And there is reason to, to, to believe that this system we, we, we would display a correlated rigid percolation transition that people have been observed, for instance, in gels. There are lots of, of other extensions that we're looking at, for instance, on isotropy and incorporating temperature. And, and yeah, there, there are a bunch of different things that you can, we can do to extend these models to and the theory to get a better understanding of these systems, yeah. Is there a hysteretic behavior in these systems? Experimentally. Hysteretic behavior. I have to think yeah. more about this. Let I me mean, try are through. They, are they in some sense close to, I mean, these are disorder systems after all. Yeah. So you would expect to, to see complex dynamics, essentially. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have to think more to answer this. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't remember quite at the top of my head, but yeah. Interesting. Okay. Are there more questions? I don't know if I... I mean, if no one else has questions, I would like to, I think it would help me if you would draw the, the RG flow that you mentioned. It would uh, oh, yeah, okay. connect with <laughs> things I'm more used to. So if you just, uh, no, uh, okay, okay, so... this, there is this Lagrangian description and this RG flow of these parameters. Uh, okay, I, 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 do not, I do not have a, a, a model for, for the renormalization group, coarse grain in it and so on. I have an educated guess for what the RG flow would look like because this is a typical crossover behavior. Now, now let, let me just introduce two quantities here, two variables, and these are delta P. Now I'm using the notation I used yesterday, delta P B and delta P R P, okay? And, and as you can see here at jamming, uh, uh, both delta PB and delta PRP are zero. And at rigid percolation, uh, I have delta PRP equals zero. But delta PB is different from zero. Now, what we expect is that I, I can draw a diagram here in terms of delta P. RP, 
and delta P B. And then there would be something like a jamming fixed point here. And a rigid percolation fixed point there. And then there might be something like a unstable manifold there. Uh, let me see, this should go like this. All these transitions are second order, these points? Uh, the transition, the jamming transition itself is first order in the bulk modulus and second order in the shear modulus. That's a kind of a complication that's, that's hard to interpret in this case. So you have two relevant perturbations at the jamming transition. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the idea is that delta P, exactly, delta PB is relevant for jamming, but not for rigid percolation. And, and if you think of something like the flow of the system, if you start at some point A here, that, that, that's uh, I'm following basically the same kind of idea that appears in the crossover behavior from the eyes into the Heisenberg model, for instance, uh, that appears, uh, you can see, for instance, in, in Karge's book. You, you, you start at some point A here that's far away from the jamming point. Okay, I mean, far away from the rigid percolation line there and the behavior is governed by the jamming point. Maybe something like this. But, but, but the closer that I get here to this rigid percolation line, the, the renormalization group equations, the flow should go very close and spend a long time here and be controlled by the rigid percolation fixed point. Now, actually coming up with something that, and I can discuss what, what basically the, the crossover region should be based on our models and using our calculations and things like that. So jamming is inaccessible, essentially. Inaccessible in... Well, it has two relevant perturbations, so the yeah. attraction is zero. So it's like the Gaussian fixed point in critical phenomena below mm -hmm. that is never controlled by that. You're saying that the only the physics is always controlled by the uh, random percolation in the end of the day. No, I'm not sure if I. That's what this diagram means. No, I mean what this diagram means is that there is a region here that there is a crossover behavior. As I get closer to this point here, the physics, the universal behavior is controlled by the rigid percolation fixed point. Yeah. But there is a crossover forget, region. It forgets about the jamming, right? The jamming is but washed jamming out. Jamming essentially is a set of measure zero. Yeah. Much like the Gaussian fixed point is, in, or free field fixed point is below four dimensions in conventional critical phenomena. You, I mean, truly, it's a crossover, but you don't say that that's a fixed point that is relevant for anything because it's inaccessible. I'm not sure I have to think about that. Um, I mean, here, probably what happens if you take only a single one of your lattices without this additional perturbation, which is to go to, to include the, uh, the honeycomb lattice, um, then you could probably see this uh, jamming behavior. <laughs> no, no, you cannot. No, no, absolutely not. No, no, I mean, the, the problem is that the honeycomb line is uh, by itself. Yes. It is, un it's under coordinated. It has less bond that's bonds that what you need. Right. The for, the for rigidity. So, so there would be, so, so Z in the honeycomb line is three. Yeah. And the isostatic point is four. So I have to find a way 
of combining the honeycomb lattice with and adding bonds to it. I understand. So you, the triangular lattice probably is jamming, as you were saying. Oh no, but the triangular lattice doesn't see jamming. That, I mean, then we miss you, you need a you need a model in which you have a zero shear modulus and a non-zero bulk modulus. So it's a it's a liquid. It's a liquid. It's marginal, but it's a liquid because it doesn't support shear, but it supports compression. Yeah. Well, liquids do. Okay. Liquids do, but for other reasons. But that's true. Liquids do have compressibility, but it's not. It's not the same kind of thing that we're considering here. Here we have this threefold symmetry of the honeycomb lattice, for instance, that yeah. so supports the compression. Yeah. Yeah, but one thing that I should comment is that our model is not the only model, the, the only way of devising. Uh, I could start with a completely, there are some lattices that have, a, that are disordered, but have a bulk modulus that's finite and a shear modulus that's zero and are exactly at Z equals ZC. I can come up with a lattice like this and people have, used them, extracted them from simulations, for instance, of spheres. And I can come up with a model that use this lattice and add next near neighbor bonds to those lattice. And then the results are gonna be essentially the same as the ones that I'm showing here. I'm not sure if it, uh, uh, the video is frozen. I think, I think I, I still am a bit confused because as Eduardo is pointing out, even if you start close to jamming, you will, after a big flow, you will end up uh, dominated by this uh, RP, right? So now if I'm I, if I start why did we close, care about jamming at all? If I start close to this manifold here, this, yeah. this line here, yeah. then the, the behavior is dominated by the rigid percolation fixed point. But if I always, cl start close to jamming, but farther away. And then there is a region here that defines this crossover behavior. <clears throat> if I start close to jamming, but far away from this rigid percolation or this rigid transition here, then I'm dominated by the jamming point. For instance, if I start here, it's gonna start spend a long time there, then it's gonna go away. Why do you draw, maybe I'm confused, why do you draw the point A approaching if the arrow on the, if it, you first indicated as if it was a relevant direction, but then you drew the air, the green flow as if it was irrelevant? Yeah. No, I, I probably should start, I don't know, something like this. You're right, let me try to. And it never goes the towards the No, no, you're, 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 away, you're, so you no you're, you're, you're right, you're right. I, I'm starting close and it's going like this, right? But it's gonna spend some time there, close okay. to the jamming and point. But if I start close to the line, it's gonna spend more time the, here. Is that the marginal perturbation? The delta PB? The yeah, going along the blue manifold, okay. Close to, is it marginal near the jamming fixed point? Is marginal relevant or is it just relevant? No, it's, oh, oh, you mean this blue here? So, okay. So the perturbation that takes you away from jamming, is it relevant? It's obviously relevant. It's relevant, yes. Is it marginally relevant or just relevant? I don't know. I mean, yeah, so, so that's what I'm saying. I, I do not have a renormalization group scheme for this. This is just a guess. This is the same thing that you would have, for instance, in the magnetic system if you had some anisotropy, right? So this is more like the problem when you are below four dimensions. You have the Gaussian fixed point or the free field fixed point, and you have the non-trivial fixed point, the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, which is your, like your RP. Okay, and you know how to calculate the three the exponents at the in the in the, at the Gaussian fixed point, which will be the analog of your jamming. 
So you should be able to compute that. I see. Uh, From your theory, at least. Okay, okay. The connection that I, that, that's possible. I have to think more about that. But the connection that I make is more, for instance, the crossover behavior that you have magnetic system. As you add some term that's an isotrop in the Ising model, for instance. You have your Ising fixed point here, and you have some anisotropy there. Yes, I know. And basically, as you get closer to, you cross some crossover you region never here. See, you never see the Heisenberg behavior. You never see. You never see the, 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 the Ising model, the Ising model. No, you see the Ising Ising. model. You don't see the Heisenberg behavior because the crossover is very rapid in that case. No, you spend uh, most of the time of the renormalization group flow is going to be spent in the neighborhood of the Heisenberg point. No. If you are close to this guy. No, you don't have, you don't get Yeah. That. No. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to spend a long time close. It's going to be dominated because you have this, you get, you're increasing an isotropy. So, so uh, uh, the it's more you increase an isotropy, it's, it's get relevant. close. It's relevant that the Heisenberg, the anisotropy is relevant at the Heisenberg fixed point because you're breaking the symmetry, you're reducing the symmetry. So the, that's a relevant operator. So you're always going to see the Ising critical behavior. I don't think that's true. Yes, because it's relevant. But, but I don't think that's true. Um, I think it's irrelevant for the Heisenberg fix, fixed point. If it is irrelevant, then the anisotropy has no effect. But this the, an, the anisotropy has effect in the Ising model. No. It's, it's relevant it's, for, it's it doesn't affect the this. universal look, behavior look, of the- Look, you have it. There is a general theory. If you begin with a large symmetry group, and you have a perturbation that breaks it to a lower, to a lower dimension, to a symmetry group which is smaller, or is a subgroup. In this case, icing. It's a relevant perturbation. And so I'm in fact, there are exact the inequalities. Model. That, there are exact inequalities that show you that the green functions that the correlators actually satisfy. The I'm mean, adding a perturbation to the Ising model. The anisotropy is going to into the as a irrelevant for the Ising model. The, the perturbation that lessens the anisotropy is irrelevant, but at the Heisenberg fixed point is relevant. But it's irrelevant for this question. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> the question here is: you should be able to know what the critical exponents are. No, I know, I know what the critical point from the theory that you developed. And I know that. Yes, that's true. We, I mean, yeah, I have developed what the, the critical exponents are, including the crossover behavior. But it's a different thing to come up with a renormalization group scheme. Why not? That, oh, but ask understanding whether it's relevant or irrelevant. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. it, it's within what you are doing. No, no, no. Yeah. I, and I'm telling you which ones are relevant and which ones are irrelevant in, in, the, in the case of my model, in the case of my system. And for the Heisenberg critical. I'm pretty sure that it's, it should be relevant there. Yeah. All right, maybe we have other questions or comments. I think I, I just- Okay, me. okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, me too, thanks. I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, I guess I have a general question. I mean, this, these lattices, I mean, is there a physical system that tells you that you should put in these two lattices or is that just something to make life more interesting or? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, um, as I mentioned briefly before, I can come up with exactly the same kind of scaling theory, the same results, if I use realistic lattices that are built from the lattices that are formed when I compress the spheres. Okay. But then, I mean, it's just convenient to use periodic lattices because they are easy to treat 
and write down the explicit formulas for, for the solutions. I guess I'm asking, is there an experiment you can do with a physical system? That, there is, are, I mean, I mean, we, we can use 3D printers and I print see. these lattices, for instance, <laughs> and, and do experiments on that. No, that works. I mean, why not? You have seen that, right? People have been doing this. Or you can do experiments on colloids, for instance. And depending on the kind of system, some of them will fall on the same universality class. So they, they may be described by the same scaling functions that I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's basically, yeah. So we, Eduardo and Pedro, I don't mind. I mean, you can keep going. There's no, Sorry? or we can go ahead. I get frozen. It's a problem with my computer. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. um, I don't have any more questions. Okay. No, me neither. Thank you. Okay. So thanks very much to you. So hey, thank you. Uh, thank okay, you. So as I said, where we.